Well, good morning, everybody, and I hope you're all keeping well. Um, there's um, we've got a few subjects um, carrying over really from the last time where I want to ask the audience something, but let me just go through the normal the normal routine. If you want to join in, then just electronically raise your hand and uh, we'll invite you in. Um, but otherwise, um, you can put stuff into the into the uh, the chat box um, and, and all of that's fine. We normally have something quite healthy going on in there at the same time as uh, we're discussing the subjects to to today. Right, OK, so uh, let's just move on. So um, today the subjects that we've got, um, I want to talk about the changes to these sessions. Um, and we don't have Kevin today, um, so he won't be giving us a, a council tax or business rates update. Um, then I just want to touch base really with the new energy rebate. And then of course we probably can't get through today without touching on uh, the the issues raising out of the Ukraine. And if we've got time, we'll talk a little bit about growth. Um, but otherwise, I think that should probably do us from to, for today. So if you don't mind, I'm going to talk about changes to these sessions. Right, so over the next few weeks, we're going to make a, a few changes uh, to to these to these weekly and monthly sessions. It's only minor changes. The slides will have a slightly different look to them. Hi, Gareth, are you in a are you in a in a plane or a train? Well, you're muted wherever you are. That looks, looks like a, a train to me. Oh, no, he's in a plane. <laughs> oh, excellent. Thank you, Gareth. <laughs> right, OK, so um, as I'm saying, these slides will have a slightly different look to them. Uh, there'll be uh, some new colours and style for us, cosmetic stuff. Um, it's just that we're reviewing all the branding and everything, just trying to make everything a bit tidier. Um, also, in in the future, we're looking at uh, handing the sessions over more to the panelists and to you delegates. Um, Kevin will continue to do a main update, but probably a main update once a month on business rates and another on council tax. Though we will have, you know, the the urgent urgent updates in between. Uh, we're going to be getting Laura to do. Um, the, we have a small child on the on the call. Is that Laura? Yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Right, um, but Laura will will be doing. Um, we'll be doing a brief on circulars. So that that will be once a month. We normally do that in the monthly ones, but we think we're probably going to combine the two together. So we'll get Paul probably to come on and do a job to market update about once a quarter. Uh, we're also going to invite on some guest panelists to come and discuss specific issues. Um, so hopefully somebody from the departments uh, amongst those 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 uh, people. And the rest of the time will be taken up on the discussion points that we raise as normal on our WhatsApp, Twitter and LinkedIn channels, um, but hopefully a bit more led by you guys, you know, to get a bit more involved and hear less, certainly less from me. Um, it is an opportunity uh, for you to shape the discussion, so please tell me what you want to talk about. Um, and we're trying going to try and plan a bit more ahead if we can. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about doing subjects on the day, um, but if we can prep a bit more, that would be excellent. Um, we're also going to do more specific sessions around subjects of interest. Um, so we've, we've done a number of those already, uh, but we're going to do more of those. And we're also planning to do some hybrid ad hoc sessions. And by that, I mean we will be somewhere physically and people will be able to either come along physically to them or be able to join via via the internet. So um, are there any questions at all on that? Not so far, Malcolm. OK, all right. But look, there's plenty of opportunity. Tell me what you want uh, and that's what we will do. So 
you know, either email me or uh, send it over the over the, the the WhatsApp group or whatever. But uh, do do tell me how you want these to work. We've we've already changed them once on the basis of how you wanted things to do, uh, but we want to do even more. Okay, um, and now I'm going to ask for a favour. Um, not today, not right this very instance, but I, I will have some short questions I want to put to all of you. And I do appreciate just how busy you all are. So I'm thinking that we'll pitch these probably in the form of a box pop, you know, one or two questions, three questions maximum, but I don't think we'll probably go that high. And these will be around attitudes or concerns or preferences. We will share the results. And the purpose of these questions is to help us define these sessions and to identify where we may run exclusive workshops. Uh, but again, we, we don't plan to to be difficult about it, but just. Um, just. Uh, um, sorry, I just saw, saw Gareth posting something, uh, but yes, we we'll, we'll just really want to sort of get your feedback. Um, so hopefully you'll you'll come involved and it's just be something that will pop up and you can just say yay nay or whatever. OK, so on that basis, uh, we do have Gareth with us. He is in a plane and he is delayed, so he may come in as as he feels fit. Uh, but otherwise, um, my first. Sounds like Gareth now. Um, is I just want to. Uh, uh, I was just going to apologise because they were supposed to be starter. You see. Okay, right. Okay, so I just want to uh, do a quick follow up on the uh, previous session that we did on the energy rebate, and I just wondered how you're all getting on. Was the was the uh, impact been on workloads, changes to process? campaigns, demands, effects on your partners. Um, yes, so can I start with you, Naomi? Um, well, quite a lot of it at the moment is still a fair amount of discovery, bearing in mind the uh, communications <laughs> didn't come out till last week. <clears throat> and uh, we are busy looking at, well, it's, it's three schemes really. The people that we hold the direct debit information for, that's sort of scheme one. Um, how are we going to identify all of them <clears throat> and pay them? Scheme two, those that aren't in um, on direct debit, how do we get that information? And interesting, the um, comms last week said they had to claim. So what constitutes a claim? We thought we'd just <clears throat> go and ask them for bank details, jobs are good. Um, big concerns about that cohort, which for us is only about 20,000, but for larger authorities are going to be significantly greater than that. We've got to um, evidence their bank details, <clears throat> which is going to be quite tricky, I think. Mm. And then the third cohort are the discretionary bods. So just trying to get some data on um, CTRs, um, E2H, looking at SMI, looking at disabled bans, both those E2H, and then trying to work out how much money we've got left and what the um, criteria is going to be. We haven't actually got an awful lot of money for this. It's only £250,000, but 1,600 awards, but quite a lot of hard work for that. <clears throat> a lot of the information at the moment is trying to manage comms, people's expectations. Um, when it was first announced, flurry of information and we couldn't do an awful lot. Now that we're trying to work out what we are going to do, we're trying to get ahead of the comms, keep people informed, but try and make it realistic. Mm. And obviously this coming weekend we're doing annual billing. <clears throat> so it's what we're going to put on the bill and more importantly, what we can add to um, the, the leaflet that's going out. So that does sound to me like an awful lot of hard work. Passes. Or, or what is a small amount of money that you've got to, to pay out? Yeah. <clears throat> 
And and what what about other people? Liz, I mean, you're you're with the housing association now. Is is uh, how's this working, working out? out. Be it there. Um, I am with the housing association, but I'm not really involved in in what they're doing. I have made some inroads into it, and actually, they're probably not terribly prepared for this at all in relation to their tenants. But I do know that I know Kevin said he was running a campaign on DD. Not that that's got anything to do with it to increase the number of of direct debits. Obviously, they've got. But on the other hand, I mean, it it is the whole. The whole instructions are incredibly fiddly and as Naomi says there's not a lot of money involved in it but of course it's been trumpeted as you know something and it's not really something it's more nothing. It's <laughs> a really cheery way of looking at it. Um, Megan uh, what are you doing down in, in mid Sussex at the moment can you tell us? Um, yeah, I can tell you. We were planning to run a direct debit claim uh, campaign. Sorry, we did annual billing over the weekend, so I've just worked an 80 hour week and stringing sentences together isn't um, <laughs> isn't easy this morning. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we were planning to. I'm not sure if we still are, but we've got quite a high take up of direct debits in Mid Sussex anyway. Um, but yeah, we're planning to just we're going to use grant approval to pay out all the direct debit people and we're still working out what we're doing with the rest of them. Right, so are you also of the view that this is a lot of work for not a huge amount of money or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and the leaflet and the sentence that we have had to put out with the annual bills means that we're going to be getting a lot of phone calls before we're actually ready to answer the questions. Um, I think the biggest concern we've got is people who are not, um, don't ha aren't, <laughs> I can't even think of the, um, you know, don't have access to the internet. Um, so we're saying keep an eye on our website, but those people who can't are just going to have to keep phoning up until we've got some answers for them as to how they can apply. Um, yeah, it's going to be a big mess. And we haven't really got time. <laughs> That's funny. Uh Gary, Gary Lazell, uh, what are you doing in Arrowwash? Um, trying to trying to keep this one as um, as as low key as possible for for now, because obviously we can't really. It's obviously a lot of, lot of new information to digest to work out what we're going to do, um, get new schemes in front of members, etc. Um, so um, without without having any sort of um, Massive DD drive. We've had eight, 80 new take ups in the last um, last few days already. Um, obviously, expecting more. We are um, over seventy percent already, so um, it's going to drive that up. But um, yeah, we're going to use um, grant grant approval. I think um, for um, the the administration to try and ease ease some of the burden. But um, yeah, we're talking thousands of thousands of um, claims with who we haven't got direct debit for that are going to have to go through and we're going to have to resource somehow, but tr really try not to consider them until sort of May, June time, because we just don't have the resource to uh, to achieve it with annual billing and year end. And our elected members get excited about this money or are they? No, members um, members have um, kept, um, kept away from it so far. So my director jumps up and down a little bit, but um, no, nobody else seems to so be able to keep the lid on on everybody else for now. That's really good. And, and let me just ask uh, Andy Sims out at Hull. What's, what's it like in Hull at the moment? Hi, Malcolm. Um, I'm dealing with my first complaint from somebody that is a DD payer, but can't understand why we can't pay it direct onto the account. Um, so yeah we're uh, we've got a meeting tomorrow where we're going to look at a uh, few things ideally we'd like to uh, put in place some sort of um, arrangement whereby um, if somebody well, we, we intend to to mail out to people before the 28th of March uh, which was the date I recall um, and 
if we don't get any response from people, we'd like to put the £150 onto their accounts. So in, in Hull, we've got a 55% direct debit take up, which leaves us with around about 56,000 people not on direct debit. So it's it, it's pretty massive for us here, really. So um, we think there's going to be a, a lot of work associated with this. Um, but at, at the moment, we, we, we took the decision not to uh, not to send out the leaflet with the year end bills. We felt it would create more contact than we would welcome at the time. Um, we put a, a tweak onto the onto the uh, line on the bill, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, we put that we would uh, be looking to make payments um, from April, uh, which we will be doing for the direct debit payers during April. But I think for everybody else, um, you can sort of watch this space and we'll be we'll be having our internal discussions uh, starting tomorrow uh, on that on that. But uh, yeah, dealing with my first complaint, uh, which has come through a, a counsellor from somebody that quite sensibly would just like us to put it on the bill. Yeah, I suspect we're probably going to see a few more complaints like that. Liz, you had a question, I think. Uh, yeah, it just occurred to me that, frankly, as as the energy crisis bites, through the year, um, those people who might elect to pay by DT, DD to receive more quickly their rebate, or it's not a rebate, their grant, would then cancel their DD <laughs> as the year goes on. Because if I was, I hate to say this, but I wouldn't advise anybody on a low income to pay by DD because of the associated costs of not being able to make the payment, which is quite likely. So where they might, of course, elect to pay by DD, I have a feeling that people will then cancel their DV, but DV, DD, further into the year. I was just inquiring whether people, I see somebody's put a thumbs up, so somebody at least agrees with me. And, and I presume, Liz, that from, from, from experience, DDs for people on low incomes, so it can be quite challenging if they're, they lose sight of what direct debits they they've got coming out and when. Yeah, I think so. This is despite some of the the newer banks and uh, some of the older banks actually giving people quite a lot of control over managing their their accounts more. Yeah, but the point there is it doesn't stop. They haven't got the money there to make the DD. They either cancel it before they can't make the payment, or they incur costs. Yeah, from the bank. Uh, yeah, and that, and that speaks volumes about the concepts around, you know, sort of transformation into into digital, isn't it? The assumptions that it's going to resolve all the problems, yeah, and make it easier for customers. It 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 doesn't. I know people who wouldn't touch a DD in relation because they are absolutely scared of bank charges, bank costs. Credit rating, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Naomi, you've got something to add to this. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we do have some concerns about the cohort that aren't on DDs. Um, we will have to contact them, asking them to claim and give us the bank details. But if they don't, um, there are quite a few of them that we won't have the facility just to credit the 150 quid to their account because their liability won't cover it. So we'll end up with refunds. And if we don't have the bank details, how are we going to refund someone without a bank details? We'll have yeah. to send a check what a, what a, for what will be a pretty small amount of money. Mm. And that, that's that's a bit of a risk, isn't it? Because I mean, actually, probably we've all moved away from using checks quite so much and they are quite expensive, aren't they? Very. And a yeah. further layer of reconciliation. Yeah, and and Tammy Tammy Fox, did did you want to to add to that? Um, I'm just echoing what everybody else is saying. The concerns really. Um, we've got about twenty four thousand that are on DD and about eight thousand that aren't. Um, but it's we we are seeing a lot of mandates coming through. To people setting up direct debits. Um, you know, people who normally didn't pay by direct debit. So I think do we have to wait till they've collected first? Um, the guidance is a bit woolly, isn't it? So 
Yeah, lots to do. <laughs> Even at this stage, it sounds like quite a lot of unanswered questions for, 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 for this and a lot of expectation. Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah, it's pressure, it's pressure that you don't need at this time of year. OK, well, I'm very sorry to hear that. Does anybody else want to add to that? Tell us what they're doing in their areas. I realise you're all quite, quite shy, shy individuals. Is anybody indicating, Jake? No, no. no. OK, all right, so um, let's uh, let's let's move on then to the to the next subject i'll probably combine it actually with the uh, with the growth as well uh, that's the ukraine stuff now um how do we see some of the consequences of this whole issue in the in the ukraine manifesting itself on our services further down the line um you know we've done this before in these sessions where we've managed to successfully identify where a problem is is going to turn up and then lo and behold it does uh, what do we think uh, can i start with you liz yes you can um well i mean obviously it's going to have an effect on housing um if we are going to take uh quite rightly refugees from this conflict conflict it is going to have an effect on housing I was listening to the radio this morning, actually, where somebody was saying, well, just we just have to build more houses. Well, if it was that simple, we wouldn't have a homeless problem at all. Yes. Um, I mean, there are obviously issues which aren't quite clear yet around, you know, acts. They're not part of the EU, not that that makes a lot of difference these days, but whether or not they are going to have, you know, access to public funds. Um, I haven't seen anything about that, so if anybody knows anything, let me know. Um, oh, it's just awful. Um, it, I, I, you know, it's just pouring, you know, it's pouring oil on already troubled waters. Not that I think we shouldn't do it, of course I don't, but it, it's not, it, none of this is, none of this has a simple solution. But then who knows, we might all be blown up shortly, so. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's a cheery, cheery thought there. I can't, I can't honestly be the harbinger of doom all the way through this. No, 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 no. no but you do is... so well at it. Ah? Uh? But you do so well at it. No, no, Naomi. <laughs> I'm an optimist. I'm a glass half full person, so I don't know why I get this, this slight <laughs> moniker. <laughs> Because these subjects we talk about can be quite depressing. Naomi, what's uh, what what do you think is going to happen for the local authorities here? Um, as Liz has just said, you know, in more pressure on housing. Um, still, won't know whether people have got access to emergency public funding, refugee status. So that will be a concern. Um, but I think for many of our communities. They do need support from local authorities, communities where individuals have family, friends still in the Ukraine or Russia. Um, and I think if we're talking to someone who is impacted by the conflict, we just need to recognise that and just think, step back a moment. Yes, we've got our jobs to do, but for these people on the phone or face to face, they're going through a nightmare at the moment. So, uh, do you think we're going to see some circulars eventually coming out of the out of the DWP, giving us some clear guidance, or do you feel that the government's yeah. going to try and I keep think, onto think, the tram lines? I think the Home Office are starting to pick up the issue. Um, there's quite a lot of pressure over the weekend on the Home Office to set things out clearly. Now, if that is going to impact on access or refusal for public funding, then obviously we mm. would have to be informed of that. And one of the, the things about having large numbers of refugees coming into an area is that that increases the amount of demand for 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 everything from. Yeah, I'm making no criticism here. It's just the realities, isn't it? 
but I mean on schooling and everything else, but that will also include things like council tax support as well, won't it? If they're eligible to apply, then yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> even if they're not, there will be um, a call on local authorities, financial services, perhaps not out, not for CTR, but for supporting homelessness, um, other sort of community development works. Um, has anybody else on here, did, did they have Afghani refugees into the areas? Because, you know, a lot of those have not been resolved already. So has anybody had any experience of, uh, of having large numbers of refugees being moved into the into their area? Not recently, but we have um, by the um, earlier conflicts <clears throat> and it, it does take council resources mm. um, and, and not just those that are perhaps in community development, but um, making sure that all departments are involved and supporting that customer, that individual, that household, that community. OK, um, can I ask John? John, uh, uh, the software, the software suppliers are are they sort of facing up, getting prepared for changes having to be made in preparation for these changes coming? Uh, in terms of the Ukraine side, no. Um, we've got the immediate bits of calf and energy bills to to worry about. Um, so it's all hands to the deck to, to the pump in order to get all that done. Um, obviously, we're keeping an eye on it. Um, doesn't affect our system too much in those terms because whether somebody's eligible to apply for benefit or not is a decision that's outside of the system. So we then just take the claims and put them on. Okay. I mean that's. I mean that's. That's that's too fair. Enough. Can, can I ask then everybody about the other side of this, which is the sanctions that are being applied at the moment? They're going to have a knock on effect. Uh, we've, we've talked quite a lot about cost of living. Does anybody see that this is this is going to have, you know, exacerbate the, the, the problem? Liz, can I ask you to? So. Uh, yes, I think um, invariably it will. Um, I really just wanted to say, I mean, let's be honest, this is another one of many perfect storms. Yeah. Uh, we've got the already um, dangerous cost of living um, that will have an effect on services. Um, if rents are increased in areas, you know, you can see homelessness going up. The cost of that is really quite immense uh, perhaps not necessarily directly to well you know directly to benefits if you're paying for temporary accommodation but directly to your authorities anyway the other thing i think it's probably good to be mindful of is the cuts in the discretionary housing fund which isn't going to help this situation at all so three elements of this cuts in your discretionary fund the ratcheting cost of living and potential of a lot of refugees coming in. Yes, can, can I ask you, Naomi, about the cuts in the HP? Were you, were you expecting that? Nope. <laughs> um, we're at the point now that we've already spent more than our current um, allocation from government. We mm. do every year, um, but we've spent it more than we have oh. recently. We were very disappointed that the LHA rates didn't increase. So they're effectively frozen at April 2020. Um, there is nowhere in the country where the rents being charged now are at April 2020 rates. And they have just skyrocketed for us in the city. Um, so say so we've already spent our current allocation and the allocation for the new financial year has dropped by just over 30 percent. Genuinely shocked by that reduction in DHP at a time when we're having to 
see issues with homelessness, um, so the LHA restrictions, other pressures on household finances, which are exponential. You know, my my food my food bill might go up by, I don't know, ten pounds a week, but for somebody on a low income, yeah, ten pounds a week is crippling, mm -hmm. absolutely crippling. It is a disproportionate increase and I, I don't go for the fancy stuff I've stopped buying champagne and gin um and and they are you know value pastas normally uh which is you know a ridiculous uh problem for low-income families and do, do you think part of the driver of this is this, this the other subject on here which we kind of kind of bring in as well is is the growth in the economy, which do you, you know, there always seems to me as though there's a kind of disconnect in here somewhere between you see a growth in the economy and then the assumption is, is everything is better. But the growth in the economy has only really brought us up to where we were back in 2019, hasn't it? And it's not equal across no. all households. Um, you know, increasing uh, incomes, sort of middle to upper incomes have certainly achieved um, the average income increases, but lower income jobs just haven't really. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it does seem to me as though, you know, it can be quite, quite, quite glib really to look up some yeah, of these but, things and not put them we, into context. But we do metrics based on um, Sort of median median income versus median cost to rent or buy property, um, and whilst those have stayed reasonably stable, when you compare that to low incomes and the cost of um, entry level housing or rents, it's gone through the roof. Mm. So those people on lower incomes are facing increasing problems and issues trying to get on the housing ladder or start renting and in places like Cambridge where there are many rental markets that a landlord can tap, tap into getting someone who's on a um, welfare benefit not likely to be high on their list of priorities yeah 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 this this is yeah it's, it's incredibly tricky I mean we see that here as well I've been mm. up late Robert uh do you, you, you want to add something to this? Robert Nellis. Sorry, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Nellis. Well, just just as it says, really, you know, DHP was reduced last year, then they split it into two. Um, they didn't give us a warning. We've had loads of meetings with them, you know, explaining what the pressures are. You know, we've been in working group after working group, you know, and you know, they said they want to listen and the 30% reduction just shows they've not listened whatsoever. Um, it's purely about numbers and basically they've screwed us. There's no other polite way of putting it because, because you know, we've gone from 1.6 million to 740,000 in two years. You know, what the hell? You know, the pressure is just so immense. And then on top of that, you know, we've had another three and a half million pounds of COVID support over the last 18 months as well. So not only have we got the impact of the DHP being withdrawn, test and trace is being withdrawn, that's all gone. The COVID support is all being withdrawn. And just as everything is hitting home, you know, they might be saying COVID is over, but actually the impacts of COVID within the community are only now just wheedling through in terms of rent arrears, council tax arrears, household bills arrears, you know, debt building up because of furlough, reduced hours. You know, so that whole combination is a whirlwind of financial pressure on our communities right now, just at the time when all the funding is being reduced or being withdrawn. Absolutely yeah. mindless. I, I was struck by the evidence that was given in Parliament a couple of weeks ago by the Secretary of State, who didn't seem to know the answers to any of the questions she was being asked. Uh, I did wonder whether she knew what was going on in her own department. 
but um, there was no mention of cuts of the BHP either. Not, not that she was asked, but she didn't reveal it to the to the committee. Too much rock music. Is that what it is? Yep. <laughs> a babe. It's God that, help us. Is, is that? I, I didn't realise that she was a rocker. Is she? Oh yeah. All right. I did, did not know that. You learn something every every, every week. Um, Bob Bob Wagstaff, you you also had a comment I think to make, and then I'm going to start to close up. Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, we look after the councils in East Lincolnshire and Boston has a huge migrant population from Eastern Europe. And we've got quite a lot of Russians in the town and I fully expect we'll start to see not just Ukrainians, but Russians in the t more Russians coming across too, especially as the sanctions start to bite. Um, and I do wonder what that's going to mean for our housing in town because we're already hopelessly overcrowded with lots of illegal high mows. Uh, and it's all just falling on s smaller and smaller resources. Well, those of us who are quite long in the tooth remember what it was like during the Serbian war, um, where we quite often had uh, both sides of the conflict in the town, settling the conflicts <laughs> in the town, as it were. Uh, are you expecting that kind of problem as well? I don't know that we have a great deal of uh, problems between bands of ethnic minorities. There's quite a problem between the indigenous population. Uh, the, the population in Boston falls into three areas. There's those that are from Boston, those that are from outside Boston, and those from outside Boston are either British or not British. And the three groups don't seem to mix particularly well. I, I fall into the I'm not from Boston, but I'm British. So all my friends are not from Boston and are British and and the groups don't mix particularly well. Uh, yeah, and that, there and, doesn't seem to be fighting within the groups. It's just between the groups. And I know this, this is a in, in an area like Boston, that it's, it's a, all of this is quite a hot potato, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, all the shops that are opening in Boston, uh, Eastern European supermarkets, uh, you get a fantastic range of beer in them, I have to say, and I drink lots of beer that I haven't ever seen before. But uh, but it's no good if you just want to buy uh, a pack of Lincolnshire sausages. The Lincolnshire sausages they serve in the Eastern European supermarkets are the worst. Uh, good sausages, though. <laughs> Lincoln sausages are the worst. Lynn McMorris, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, following on from Bob, that the um, we had a very similar situation um, when I was at Colchester in terms of um, we actually took in a lot of uh, Iraqi refugees back in the day, that that all came to fruition. And we had a massive problem um, where we worked very closely with county about schools because Colchester's a garrison town and what the schools were worried about was if some poor lad had lost his dad in Iraq, he wasn't going to think about the fact that the little Iraqi boy next to him was actually from a family that helped the soldiers. And there was a huge sort of like um, campaign about preparing children in schools for the intake of the Iraqi children. Um, but it's things like that that you know, the government don't think about that, but together we had a huge campaign to make sure they all settled well and everything else. It was sort of a county and Colchester thing, but sometimes people don't think. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. <clears throat> quite clear, yeah. And, and and I guess probably that there's a kind of connection here, isn't there, from what Robert was saying about the DHPs, what you, you were saying about the government not yeah. thinking what Bob was saying and everything else that we've been talking about today. There's a massive disconnect between government. I'm sure this has always been the case between government and and what it's like on the front line actually having to to deliver. I think on that cheery note, I'm going to close off the meeting. Can I thank everybody for being so involved? I know some of you were suddenly involved and you weren't expecting to be, but I appreciate uh, that, that you've all chipped in and um, 
yeah and we'll see you see you next next week don't forget to let me know what you want to chat about uh if you do that through the whatsapp group or um or you can email me if you're not members of the whatsapp group um uh, betty will send out a note or jake will send out a note uh, and remind everybody how you can can get onto that group uh because the conversation tends to carry on there teams is a bit weird some of you can talk on teams some of you can't talk on teams i don't really know quite how it works but otherwise i shall see you all next week and thank you very much uh for today thank you bye thanks all <laughs>